Because of the way the universe is created, we each of us live in two worlds at the same time. We have to live in the outer life of our own bodies and the inner life of our own souls. Hello and welcome to Living the Inner Life. I'm Chris Sheridan and I've been studying consciousness, metaphysics, psychology, philosophy, really anything that has anything and everything to do with our inner lives, the mind, the power of mind to help shape the way we react, respond, and interact with the outside world, with all the things we do, the places we go, and the people we know. All right, so this episode, I want to talk about something that's been happening recently. There's been a lot of news about flying saucers, UFOs, things in the sky. And while this may seem timely now, this could be a discussion we could have had 40 or 50 years ago, because this UFO phenomenon has been going on for a long time. Now, some people think that it started around the time of World War II, when the Americans developed the atomic bomb, and shortly thereafter, Russia followed suit, and that there was a risk of upsetting not only life on Earth, but if you dramatically affected the Earth, you would affect the other planets, the solar system, and therefore that these aliens, these creatures from outer space are coming here in their spaceships to warn us and to keep us from not only destroying ourselves, but from messing things up for some other people or beings uh, in the cosmos. And this was popularized in science fiction movies, uh, at the time, and still is. It's a running theme as a reason, you know, if they are here, not only who are they, but why, and what does that have to do with us? And you may be wondering, what does this have to do with the inner life? Because really, there's nothing more out there <laughs> than outer space, okay? So anything that has anything to do with our lives even if we just think about something conceptually, it affects us. It affects our inner lives. It affects who we are. And more importantly, especially with the UFO phenomenon, that this would challenge our existing paradigm, the way we look not only at society, but ourselves about spirituality, about God, about angels, about life and death, about technology, about so many things, about being alone in the universe. Okay, and these are heavy, heavy questions. And there's some people believe that the government, whoever, has known a long time that these crafts and creatures have been coming here. Some also think that they walk among us and interact with our governments and militaries and things like that. And that may be true, uh, but I'm not really discussing the truthfulness or the reality of flying saucers and creatures from another planet. Okay, it's what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to us as human beings? And what does this affect, and in what way does it affect, in our culture, our society? with how we live our lives, okay? Big, big picture things. Well, there's an astronomer from the 70s, 1970s, Carl Sagan, and he talked a lot about the cosmos and interplanetary things, uh, space travel. He was deeply involved with NASA and the Planetary Society, uh, JPL, all these agencies, and very popular. He had a pop culture uh, kind of uh, a flair to him. He was on the talk shows and, and all different kinds of things. He was really the face um, of American astronomy uh, for quite a, a long time. And he gave this quote that I think is really interesting and it's a lot of food for thought. He said two things could be true. Either we're alone in the universe or we're not alone in the universe. Both are equally frightening, <laughs> okay? And I think he's right. Uh, the implications of being alone, you know, this lonely planet, this little rock in the middle of nowhere, 
Uh, which actually, though, if you're wondering if there are creatures from outer space, well, if you look at a star map, apparently we are. We, that's exactly where we live, in outer space on a planet, according to science. So there's at least one outer space creature, <laughs> and that's the human beings and all the other animals that live on this planet. But what we're talking about is being alone or do we have star brothers and sisters, as a lot of indigenous uh, cultures and tribes have believed uh, since the beginning of their time? They have origin myths. A lot of religions have origin myths, these cosmogenies. You know, how was the universe created? How was man created? How did all this come about? Uh, and depending on how you read them, uh, they seemingly have this extraterrestrial or cosmos-oriented uh, uh, standpoint, right? That these angels go to heaven, and heaven was a another word for the sky. Even in Exodus, in the Bible, they're talking about rising up in a pillar of cloud and fire. And, well, if you've ever seen a rocket take off, it kind of looks like a pillar of fire and cloud. So not sure what they were seeing, not sure what they were trying to describe, but here we are, and we're faced again with this deep philosophical question, are we alone in the universe? Or, if we're not alone, then who are we with? Should we be afraid of them? If you watch Hollywood movies, it seems like the aliens, if you want to call them that, want to do one of two things. They either want to come here and destroy us or conquer us, or they're just lost and they want to get home, like E.T., all right. And if you've ever looked up in the sky at night and seen the stars of the Milky Way or the belt of Orion and thought, ah, it's some connection. You know, I belong there. Maybe I was from there. You know, I think we are always looking up, whether we actually do it or not. But looking up to something higher, something greater. You know, a lot of times we feel strangers <laughs> in a strange land. Even in our own bodies, sometimes we don't feel like this is the natural habitat, right? That we're, we're in exile, or we're on vacation, or we're somewhere else doing something else other than the other place where we're actually from and belong. Maybe we're trying to get home, and we're also trying to destroy each other too, which is another topic, but it has something to do with this visitation, this interaction, and why is it that we're seeing this again at this time? Is that important? All right, so not being alone can be terrifying because we don't know who these people are. Uh, at least your average person doesn't. I'm sure if they're here, somebody knows something somewhere. And even then, that's, that's a, a philosophical concept. That's something that has to do with conscious and culture. What, if this is being kept secret, why? Are we not ready for it? In the movie 2001, that was one of the questions, uh, one of the issues that was talked about. And that is, do we disclose this information to the public? The culture shock might be too enormous. It might be so difficult for us to accept. And maybe 40, 50 years ago, that was true. I would like to think we as individuals and as a culture are at that place now where we could accept that we're not alone in the universe. But that brings up a lot of other questions like, are they going to control us? Can we learn from them? Is it going to advance our technology? Maybe. Ostensibly, they have more technology than we do if they're able to travel amongst the stars and between the planets and things like that. But I'm very interested in, well, if they are here or are coming, I would like to know about their consciousness. You know, what do they think? How do they look at the world? How do they use their mental and philosophical capacity. You know, what is their power of thought and thinking? Is it more advanced than ours? Maybe they're less advanced and they just have all this technology and they rely on it. I don't know. I would like to think that technological advances also come with 
philosophical advances, advances in consciousness. And it seems as though that might be true, but it really looks like the technology advances faster than the ethics, than the contemplation and the consideration of these technological advances. And also, which I think is worse, there is such a deep reliance on them now that we've made this machine, this computer, this uh, telescope, this x-ray machine, all this technology, artificial intelligence. What is that telling us? If we rely on it so much that we're either second guessing our own capacities or we're just not using them. We're not relying on them. We're not working out. We're not flexing that muscle of consciousness. And if so, like any other muscle, it will atrophy. And at least for earthly technology, who's writing this stuff, right? The people in Silicon Valley, um, they'd say it, a bunch of computer nerds that probably aren't that socially interactive and they're the ones that are designing social media or the artificial intelligence is being done by, yes, very smart people, but they maybe aren't qualified to program everything, even though technically and, you know, with mathematics and coding skills, they can code this artificial intelligence. But does that include philosophical, ethical matters of consciousness that may or may not appear, all right? Because a lot of times what we do when it's a computer or anything else, it just magnifies or amplifies whatever it is we put into it. If it's the right thing, it'll make that bigger. If we put the wrong thing in, it'll make that louder and more effective and more influential, all right? So we have to really be careful with that and really ask these questions You know, are we even ready for the technology that we have right now? I think this rush to get on board with AI, artificial intelligence, and all these other things is kind of a turning away from what we already have within us. And we're not using that to its fullest. I'm quite convinced of that, right? I know in times of my life when I have been operating at peak efficiency and maximizing everything I can do, if it's physically or academically or creatively, artistically, or in relationship or in family matters. I've been, you know, super involved and really operating on all cylinders with great efficiency and great power. And other times I haven't been because of troubles in the mind, troubles in the heart, any number of things that if you live long enough, you can get kind of disillusioned by life or some things in it, um, or at least have some questions and perhaps some difficulty. Uh, So I know we can do more. I think we used to use more when we didn't have some of this technology. I think we used our brains, we used our hearts, we used our intuitive creative, artistic senses, since we didn't have the instrument to maybe measure something or find something out or peer deeply like a microscope into something. But you had to use the mind's eye, the creative intelligence that can look into things without an actual scope, but you are looking in with consciousness. And I think we run a real risk of doing great damage to ourselves and perhaps, you know, maybe even our humanity. If we turn so much more, we're already, we've already made the pivot, but if we continue to rely on these gadgets and again, maybe, you know, I think a lot of the technological advances are great. They're necessary. It's natural. We're growing, we're learning and we're developing new things, but this, 100% reliance on them and not really using our own capacities, our own eyes, our physical eyes, our mind's eye, and history and learning, you know, old healing techniques that have been forgotten and we just want to take some pill that's been manufactured and it's easier, you know, it's it's a cop-out, really. 
I think we need to really work on our intelligence, our own human intelligence. All right. And if it takes extraterrestrials to come here and help us do that and remind us that maybe technology isn't everything, that we have to equally, if not more so, develop our inner capacities. I'm not sure. So to get to the question on, are they real? You know, are these spaceships, these flying saucers, these spheres, these strange objects moving in incredible ways across the sky or deep under the sea, are they real? Or what is it? There's obviously some phenomenon that just doesn't come out of nowhere. Somebody's seeing something. People are experiencing something, these pilots that are chasing something in the sky. We may not really know what it is. And the Swiss psychologist, Dr. Carl Jung, in the 1950s, kind of at the height of the first wave of UFO and extraterrestrial interest and really mania in the country, you know, a lot of people are really very, very much interested in these kinds of things as we are today. He, being a depth psychologist, an archetypal psychologist, he would look at things like that, no matter what it is, whether it's mythology or divination or alchemy. He looked also at the flying saucers as being mostly a psychological phenomenon, something that goes on inside our mind, something that affects our psyche, our being, okay, seeing these things. And he spent more time considering that and wrote about it, wrote an essay about it. And what he talked about was that we may not know what they are. It just say there is something. There is something out there. People are experiencing something. But what is it that we are experiencing? And the way the mind works is that we learn from things that we know. Okay, going up against maybe something we don't know or compare it with something we know if we come across something new. And we'll look at it in those terms and we will describe it using terms and images that are familiar with us, that are in our language. So lights going across the sky, you know, a long time ago it was angelic beings, or it was the chariots, you know, going across the sky like Helios, you know, taking the four horses and pulling the sun from sunrise to sunset across the sky. Okay, so he's in a chariot, the chariots of the gods, right? It was even a book. And at some point, they were thought of as ships, giant clipper ships. There was like a boat with a sail and a mast, and it was flying through the air because that was a familiar piece of technology. Uh, it was something that carried people great distances. It was a huge part of transportation for centuries until we developed steam. And then we have trains and cars and things like that. And in our time, say the 20th century forward, we have this industrial revolution. We have this technological viewpoint of things. And it could very well be that instead of seeing actual space ships, and we're still calling them ships, right? Uh, instead of seeing these space craft, we may be seeing something, but what we are using in our experience, what we are drawing from through, of course, science fiction, and all the technology and metal vehicles that we have had for the last 150 years or so, that that's what we're seeing, that we're overlaying that on. We're seeing something we can't describe, can't explain, but we can, based on what we do know, we see it on those terms. So it's like a, an airplane or something or a metal craft. Interesting thought, and there's actually something to this. When some of the explorers came to the New World. This would have probably been in Mexico or uh, South America, but from Portugal or Spain when the conquistadors and uh, those people came uh, to the Americas. They 
came in their big ships and they would, of course, anchor the ship offshore and then take a dinghy or, you know, smaller boat uh, to get onto the shore. But the shaman and the, the people didn't see the ships, okay? They didn't see the boats out there because they'd never seen anything like that. But they saw disturbances in the water. And I guess they could see part of the sails and they thought they were birds out there, but they kept thinking and they kept praying on it and they kept watching until finally it was able to materialize because they had no experience, no prior vision in textbooks, or I don't even know if they had books in written language, um, but there was nothing in their culture, nothing in their experience or history that would know what a sailing ship was. So they didn't really see them at first. Interesting how the mind works. So we may be seeing some inexplicable, unexplainable, indescribable phenomenon. And the way our minds can make sense of it is that we turn them into spaceships because that's something that we know. We know ships, we know cars, we know planes, we know things that fly in the air. And definitely a technological, they're always metal. It's always some metal that these saucers are, are made out of. And that's another interesting thought because this is how it works on our mind. You know, again, this psychological phenomenon may be more important or at least as important as the actual technological or physical visitation by other creatures in some in a interplanetary spacecraft. Okay, now, certainly that will be astounding. That will be amazing. That will be life-changing for probably the entire culture, uh, the entire planetary culture, uh, if and when, and I assume it will happen at some point. But in the meantime, you know, what do we think about it? What do we make about it? Some people are worried that, well, then, well, gosh, if, you know, these you know, super advanced beings come down, everything we thought about God and angels and, you know, intercessory, uh, accessory beings is... Oh, that's all going to be proven false. And I'm not so sure about that. What mythology would these visitors have? What God do they pray to? Who made them? What's their creation myth? Okay, it may just be kicking the can down the road a little bit. Of course, they would be more advanced in a lot of ways, maybe in every way, maybe ethically and morally and philosophically too. That would be great. I'm very interested in that as much as I am in the technology, I would love to learn. Uh, but we have enough to learn. We have enough to draw from. The great sages and philosophers and speakers and writers and thinkers of all the ages, anything that has been written down or carried through storytelling is available to us. There is so much out there that tells us from the collective history of our race, that is the human race, on what it means to be a person. How do we live? What happens after we live? What happens before we get here? And how is this life cycle continuing? And what does that mean for ourselves and our future? So it's a lot to think about, but the one thing I think to think about the most, at least that I've been thinking about, I'm asking you to think about too, is what would this mean? What does it mean to have other visitations, other beings that are more advanced than us coming to our planet and interacting with us. How do we look at ourselves? What paradigm would change? Okay. It's a lot <laughs> to consider. And uh, maybe this is more of a thought exercise, but it's really important because it shines a light on who we are. Okay. Okay. If there are beings more advanced than humans, does that mean we're lowly animals? Or does that mean that maybe we are evolving uh, psychologically and in other areas, uh, not just physically or technologically, that there's, you know, this, the evolution of the psyche, of the soul, that we are you know, in the position that we can grow and learn and do more on the inner part of ourselves? I think that's fascinating. So let me know what you think, if you can leave a comment, and we will see you here next time on Living the Inner Life, and we may not be alone, so we'll see you then. <laughs>